So welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you for class today. Today's class is going to be amazing. We have a great VIP coming into class today and teaches all about the Supreme Court, what's going on, and some modern conversations around the cases. This is Dahlia Lithwick, who is a Supreme Court lawyer. She is an expert in writing on journalism around the Supreme Court and really just engaging so many different types of audiences. We'll be led in this discussion, but I, our head, our chief scholar, Jeffrey Rosen, and my name is Curry Sautner. I'm the chief learning officer at the Constitution Center. I'll be in the chat with you. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get them to Dahlia and Jeff. Any further ado, Jeff, turn it over to you. Wonderful, thank you, Curry. And welcome, Dahlia. You are so generous to share your time with us. Friends, I cannot wait for you to hear Dahlia's light and wisdom and insight and in which she is one of the great writers on the Supreme Court. She and I have been friends for many years and I always learn and feel uplifted whenever I talk with her. So I think mostly you should be able to ask her questions. So really keep them coming in the chat. I'm gonna start them off with just a few uh, questions and then we'll turn it over to you. Dahlia, just before we started, you said you just interviewed Justice Breyer. Uh, tell us about that interview and what you're able to share and what you learned. Well, I want to start by thanking you, Jeff, and you, Carrie, and everybody at the Constitution Center, which is one of my favorite, my favorite places in the country. And I told Jeff a long time ago that my son was like little, little, little in school when they took him there. And I thought, what are they doing? He's too little. And he came back a new man. Uh, so thank you for what y'all are doing. Um, and it's a delight to be with everyone. I hope everyone is healthy as possible and um, enjoying the holidays as much as possible. So I got to interview um, Justice Breyer. It was actually nothing to do with my beat, um, nothing to do with the court. Slate does a very cheeky 80 over 80 thing where we feel like we get too obsessed with the 20 under 20s and the 14s under 14s. And so we, with all due respect to 14 year olds. And so we do uh, something particularly this year in COVID felt important, which is talk to 80 people who are 80. And so Justice Breyer agreed to participate. And then Jeff, as you know, as well as I, once you get him on a Zoom, there's nothing he won't talk about. Um, so we, we really got to chat about, and this was actually very beautiful. We got to talk about what it's like he's in lockdown with his grandkids. Uh, so talked about what it is like to be a grandfather when you're there all the time with the people and how he's learning a lot about rap music and they're learning a lot about Frank Sinatra. And then we just talked about sort of aging and how he's started a little bit to forget things and needs to write things down a little more. And he cracked me up because he said, more often than not now, he turns to his clerks and says things like, get me the case about the thing where the person, and they have to kind of reverse engineer what he's talking about. So case names uh, sliding away, but he just was charming and lovely and generous. And folks will be able to um, read the interview on Monday. That is just, Wonderful. And I, I, if you could share his TV watching, because that's really great as well. The, the, the best part was, I should have led with this, Jeff. I, I said, you know, you're the same age as my parents. They're using um, the lockdown to like tour art galleries they've never been to and go to lectures and do all sorts of things and stalk their daughter on the internet. Like, what are you doing with your time? And he said, I don't usually watch TV, but I'm using the lockdown to rewatch the entire um, MASH from beginning to end. That would be a show um, from the 1970s about, I guess it was technically about the Korean War, but it was really about Vietnam. Uh, but I asked him how MASH holds up all these decades later. And he's like, holds up. It's, it's real. It's true. It's my life. So he, he is firmly located in the world of MASH 19, circa 1975. Wow, wonderful, and it was a great show. Friends, if you feel like a blast from the past, check it out. All right, well, from uh, that uh, wonderful human insight to this morning's news, uh, this morning, the court issued a decision in Trump versus New York, and it was a six to three decision involving whether or not the president can exclude non-citizens from the census for purposes of apportionment. 
Um, I know neither of us has had the chance to read it carefully, so we're, we won't uh, go in too deeply, but there was a per curiam decision. Per curiam means by the court, it wasn't signed by anyone. And then there was a dissent written by Justice Breyer, as it happens for the three uh, more uh, liberal justices, Justices Kagan and Sotomayor. Can you give us a quick sense of what the majority held and what Justice Breyer said in dissent? Yeah, this is a follow on to a long standing effort that the Trump administration has been trying to put into place, although it predates the Trump administration, to essentially not have people counted for the census purposes if uh, they are what they call sort of illegal. Uh, 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 citizen, uh, non-citizens. And it's really important to understand that the census is what, as Jeff just said, we use those numbers to figure out apportionment. So we, we are drawing districts based on those numbers. Also allocating money, uh, huge amounts of money, and that turns on how many people are counted for purposes of the census. Um, it's very clear that all persons are supposed to be counted. That's the language, it's not in dispute. Uh, but suddenly we're seeing an effort to redefine that as all people who are here lawfully, that was the effort. And of course, the problem is that that means that a lot of jurisdictions that have many, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, aliens here or folks who are not citizens are not going to be counted. So it's going to throw off numbers for apportionment. It's going to massively throw off uh, numbers for funding. And as Jeff says, the court, uh, this was brought by a bunch of states, including New York, who challenged that decision and said, the plain meaning of the word persons is persons. Uh, you can't start hiving off people and not counting them. Um, and the court, although they heard it and seemed skeptical that the plain meaning of the language persons now means not persons, uh, by a 6-3 margin, as Jeff says, uh, said that the issue is not yet right for the court to decide, that there's nobody who has what's called standing uh, yet because the bad thing that is being alleged hasn't yet happened. So essentially come back to us um, when, they're, when they actually do this thing and their actual harms. And I guess the only other thing that's worth flagging here, as, as Jeff notes, Justice Breyer writes a pretty blistering uh, dissent that's joined by Kagan and Sotomayor, uh, in which he says, you know, th the bad thing is clearly going to happen. It's not a question. The standard for what um, you should be able to allege to make this stop is much lower than this. Uh, he's very, very frustrated and also frustrated by the distortion of language. But I think, Jeff, it's worth seeing this alongside some of the other per curiam opinions that are coming down. These are unsigned opinions, some of them coming down late at night. We don't know, often the cases are not briefed or argued. We don't know in this case it was actually argued. But the court is seemingly having a very, very different standard for who has standing to come and bring a case uh, in this instance uh, and in some of the COVID cases that we've seen. That's such an interesting observation and I agree. It seems like there's something new going on. Talk about those cases you just mentioned, the, the, the COVID uh, case arising out of New York, which we talked about in class briefly a, a week or so ago, was um, handed down quickly and there, there was an unsigned per curiam decision that some people thought was written by Justice Barrett and then these separate statements by Justice Gorsuch and, and as well as some dissents. And then of course we had the uh, recent Texas election case, which was, had, there was no written opinion, but was disposed with a single uh, sentence or two significant sentences. So, so, so tell us, how this is different than the way the court usually operates with full briefing and full argument and everyone putting their name on their decision. And what do you think that those cases in particular, the COVID case and the election case, tell us about the court today? Well, there's a lot there. I, I would start by saying that I hope you all have heard the term shadow docket. It might be one of the single most important phrases that is emerging, I think, in this sort of new decade. And that is essentially, as Jeff said, this whole host of cases that are now being decided uh, without oral argument, without complete briefing. It's interesting, Jeff, I talked to Sherilyn Eiffel um, of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and she said as a lawyer to have cases disposed of this way, where you have a district court judge 
who has hundreds of pages of findings of fact, hundreds of pages of things that are in dispute and to have the court in a paragraph, an unsigned paragraph, make it all go away. She's like, this is a nightmare for a civil rights attorney. All we have is this facts that we can amass and bring to a court. And so I think that the general, and this won't surprise anyone, the general anxiety around the shadow docket is, we don't know what the reasoning is. We get very incomplete analysis of what the court has decided and why. We don't know necessarily which justices have decided what, we don't know who's written what. And so it is, there is a sense in which this utter lack of transparency about what's happening and why it's happening is really in collision with what the one promise that the court has always made to us, which is that's fine, you can't have cameras in here, it's fine, we meet in secret, but everything we decide we do in the four corners of what we write. That's the court's bargain with us, right? That they get much less transparency maybe than they should, but in exchange they show their work and that's what's really falling away. And it's one of the things that, you know, it long predates the COVID cases. We saw it over the summer in a bunch of death penalty uh, cases where things should not be decided, particularly life and death issues with like back of the cocktail napkin, uh, half sentences. So that's, I think the, the issue, like qua issue, and then you asked about the two cases, you know, the one uh, is the Texas kind of Hail Mary attempt that was uh, filed uh, to try to challenge the election results in four other states. The reason it was kind of interesting is it was brought under a jurisdictional rule that would have allowed them to go straight to the Supreme Court. It's the kind of rule that states, when a state sues another state over you know, land use or water rights, they're allowed to go under this original jurisdiction. This kind of was a very bizarre thing because they were just saying, Pennsylvania, we want you to throw out all your votes. We don't like how you administered your election. Um, and we had, as you know, 16 state attorney generals from other states signed on, a whole bunch of uh, members of the House signed on, I think there was at least some filament of a sense that if the court was going to have a vehicle to decide Bush v. Gore 2.0, this would be it. And as you noted, Jeff, the court batted it away and essentially said, you know, this is, this is not, didn't explain, just said, go away. Um, two of the justices felt that under that jurisdictional rule, the court should have allowed it to be filed, uh, but also said, we're, we're not we're not messing with this. So that was the one. Um, and as you point out, we don't get good analytical show your work understanding of what it was that the court decided more or less they just decided they wanted um, Texas to go away. Um, and that I think in conjunction with these COVID cases and this is really where we start to see Justice Barrett making a difference because we had a couple of cases that came up in the summer from Nevada, um, from California in which uh, shutdown orders were being challenged as applied specifically to houses of worship that didn't like the caps on how many people could attend. Uh, those cases, while Justice Ginsburg was still on the court, were decided against uh, the religious petitioners with Justice Roberts playing a really important role saying, dude, whatever else I am, I'm not a public health expert. And if your governor says, uh, we got to follow these rules, we're following these rules. You may recall that in the Nevada case, there were very sharp dissents from that logic from justices who were really affronted that synagogues and churches were being told that they should shut down and casinos were allowed to stay open. So that was the state of play uh, as recently as this summer after uh, Justice Ginsburg dies and is replaced by Justice Barrett, we are now seeing a string of, as Jeff says, the archdiocese in New York, uh, and then a whole bunch of cases that have followed in just two weeks where the court has used the archdiocese uh, decision to essentially say all sorts of lockdown orders, all sorts of caps, on uh, church and synagogue participation are unlawful. And it kind of culminates late yesterday in a Kentucky uh, school decision where a religious school in Kentucky is questioning the orders uh, that they got to shut down saying, we don't wanna be even likened to other schools, to public schools. We wanna be treated uh, uh, differently 
uh, the court in that instance, actually shifting back to the old uh, analysis saying this is essentially moot uh, because these kids are going home in two days anyway. This is not a live issue right now. Um, we'll revisit it if we have to. Uh, but again, very, very sharp, angry dissents from Justice Alito and Gorsuch who really feel that these are First Amendment religious violations. So I think put this together with sort of everything else we're talking about, Jeff, it's clear these are being decided in three, four sentences in a paragraph, unclear again who's writing, unclear exactly what the logic is. But I think when I look at the two pieces, it's hard to understand how a bunch of cases about lockdown orders that are all moot for various reasons are being decided with the court saying, we think these are gonna come back. We think these rules are gonna come back. So we're jumping in now. And then you have actual harms, I think in the census case and the court saying, go away. And, and when you have a real problem, come, come back to us. So it feels as though standing doctrine is getting very, very strange to track analysis here, I guess is what I would say. Wow, that is so fascinating. It is wonderful to hear you think aloud about this really important change in the way the court is operating and our chat is lighting up with follow-up questions and they're encapsulated in Sarah Cunningham's excellent question, why the silence? What's different now and what does it mean for the court? And I have this, uh, I have the same question. I'd love you, I don't know the answer to that. I, I wonder, you said that it started over the summer with the death penalty cases. Is it related to COVID and the uh, virtual oral arguments or something else uh, that's changed? And then other friends ask, uh, what are the costs of this transparency? How can this be legal? Uh, uh, do you have any tips on the shadow processes to get seats in the courtroom? And basically lots of folks just wondering what the consequences of this new thing is. But, but my question to you is, is, is uh, why is this happening now? Well, I think to be very clear, uh, I started hearing this critique of the shadow docket long before COVID. And I think probably Steve Vladek at University of Texas has written about it a whole bunch. Um, Leah Lippman has written about it. So this, I think it's fair to say predates uh, this past summer, the, the question about why it's ticking up is really fascinating. I guess I'd be curious for your thoughts, Jeff. I mean, one uh, readily uh, apparent thing to me is that the court is just getting more and more business than it can handle. It's getting last minute petitions. It's getting petitions that for all kinds of reasons, we just talked about the jurisdictional uh, reason in the Texas case, the court had to decide immediately, right? The census case, the court really, uh, uh, well, the census case was actually argued, but those death penalty cases were coming up from courts of appeals. We had imminent executions scheduled in one instance, right? We had a DC circuit opinion by Judge Tatel that the court had to wheel a gurney in and out of the death chamber waiting this summer for these to be resolved. So there's a part of me that thinks the, the, the larger global critique is the court is deciding too much and we're all running to the court with all of our issues. And there is, I think a meaningful conversation. Je you've been one of the people who's been saying it for years, Jeff, that the court has in interposed itself into too much. This is the opposite of judicial humility. I think that's the, the large sort of scale that, that we can't run questions to the court at the last minute on things as consequential as you know Pennsylvania's elections apparatus, and then expect fully hashed out sound answers. So we're getting bad answers because we're, we're running at the last minute. But I think that there is just this other issue of the court is really having a problem with transparency right now. I think the court is in a lot of these instances time notwithstanding, just failing to show its work and failing to do the best possible job of telling us who wrote what and why and what the analysis is. And I think that's the thing, in addition to the larger critique that the court is being asked to do too much at the last minute, that the court is responding by kind of closing the blanket around the very, very limited glimpse we get into the court. I think that is something to worry about. Thank, thanks for all of those thoughts. And I think you're, you're certainly right that the more the court is asked to do, the quicker it does it and the less transparent it is. 
the justices themselves are obviously concerned about uh, uh, nationwide injunctions, about district courts who are jumping in to tell the president he can't do something and they feel an obligation quickly to reverse and that may lead to these hasty non-transparent decisions. I suddenly recalled a old law review article I learned about in law school by H.L.A. Hart, the great scholar, um, and it was called the time chart of the justices. And um, he basically said the court makes decisions badly when it makes them quickly. And around Bush v. Gore, many of us remembered that piece and said the decision was made so fast that the arguments suffered as a result. Um, so uh, what do you think of that as one possible explanation that the district-wide injunctions uh, leading them to act in more quickly? And then let's continue to take this a beat. We have some friends asking about the old an important question about cameras in the courtroom, what could be done to increase transparency at a time when the justices are deciding cases faster and giving fewer reasons? Well, I guess we should be super clear on that latter point that if you have cases that are not being argued and briefed fully, then having cameras in the courtroom makes no decision, right? These are uh, events that are taking place entirely in conference, in chambers, uh, draft opinions being circulated. So in a sense, cameras doesn't get to the heart of this particular problem. And that in and of itself is a worry. Um, it's interesting, Jeff, I wrote a piece a few weeks ago. I say weeks, but it could be months or years huh. or days. I've lost all time is made of molasses, but I did write a piece post-election, kind of lauding what I called the slow law movement, akin to the slow food movement, saying yeah. it was actually a good thing that the courts, which we have been so frustrated over the last few years, that they couldn't decide Don McGahn, they couldn't decide John Bolton, case after case, seem to, including the president's financial records, just letting the the uh, parties run out the clock time after time and how maddening it was all due respect to the turtles that you and I both know are, are built into the architecture of the court but sometimes you have to decide and you can't slow walk anything so I guess that's my slight response to your critique about you know, when you do things too quickly, we complain. When you do things too slowly, we also complain. It seems that there's no amount of time that is the correct mm -hmm. amount of time in which to do justice and do it right in a timely way. I will say I was heartened by the elections litigation, not at the Supreme Court, but in courts around the country where we really saw it last weekend in Wisconsin, a, a district court judge said, I am going to take the time. I'm going to hear all all the complaints. I'm going to actually air all this publicly and respond. And I think there is a place for doing it in, in a fashion that is slow and methodical and careful. I think that the larger problem for the Supreme Court is they seem to be in a hurry on some places and go very slow in others. So maybe my answer to the question is not that I'm fighting the hypo, Jeff, but I think that the court is not consistent. And the idea that you know, the Kentucky uh, Christian Academy case needed to be decided immediately, even though the school was, you know, not going to be implicated by uh, the governor's decision. That's a huge hurry. Uh, there's no hurry seemingly in the census case. We'll let that play out and see if actual people are actually disenfranchised and uh, districts are malapportioned, and then we'll decide if there was a harm. So maybe my long-winded answer, Jeff, is that the court is doing both and neither, going too fast and mm -hmm. too slow, and it seems almost entirely ends-driven, and that's the worry. Ah, no, but that's an important caution. Friends, you heard what Dahlia just said, and ends driven. She's suggesting that whether the court goes fast or slow may depend on how they want the case to come out. And of course, that's not what we want judges to do. Um, I'm so glad, Dahlia, that you mentioned the lower court's treatment of the election litigation. The Washington Post had a piece just a few days ago called The Last Wall, how dozens of judges across the political spectrum rejected President Trump's efforts to overturn the election, noting that in a remarkable show of near unanimity, at least 86 judges uh, rejected at least one post-election lawsuits and those were appointed by Republicans as well as Democrats. Do you agree or disagree with those who celebrate generally the performance of the lower federal courts and the Supreme Court in the election litigation? 
saying that it was the one institution of government that really was nonpartisan and deliberative. Um, and how shall we put the performance of the courts in the election litigation into the mix of our judgment about how the Supreme Court is behaving? It, it is, I think, the existential question that people like you and I, court watchers, are asking ourselves right now is, you know, when we hear people say the institutions held, one of the institutions for certain that held was the judicial branch. And it's worth at least noting that some of us who have complained that Donald Trump has seated one in four federal judges, you know, this is a, a, a very different judicial branch from the one uh, that we knew in 2016. And yet, uh, I think it's fair to say that both uh, state and federal courts have, for all the reasons you just cited, acquitted themselves really well. I, I would note, I just got off, uh, finished interviewing uh, Jocelyn Benson, who was the is the Secretary of State uh, in Michigan for my podcast tomorrow. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that state secretaries of state, state attorneys general, uh, a lot of election administrators top to bottom um, have been amazing. And I wanna give them credit that there seemed to have been an absolute red line between uh, state political actors who are willing to be completely fact free and partisan and those up to some of the highest levels, right? What we're seeing uh, 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 in Georgia, you know, from elected officials who are without doubt Republican, but really I think stood for law and order. So I wanna say they are part of, I think um, the last wall as well. I, I think on the courts, I would just note, and there was a, a good piece in the Atlantic, I'll pop in the chat, but I think it's worth at least noting that going into this election, we had three, maybe four, possibly five members of the Supreme Court who were really willing to entertain some crazy stuff. And whether it was Justice Kavanaugh citing the Rehnquist, uh, a Rehnquist concurrence in Bush v. Gore as though it was a majority opinion, or Justice Alito talking about mail-in balloting and how that somehow taints the election, we did have some really alarming dicta in some of uh, the, 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 even at the Supreme Court in some of those run-up cases to the election. So I wanna be super meticulous in our terms and say that without a doubt, the courts did the thing they had to do, which is say, crazy is crazy and we're not entertaining crazy and we're not legitimizing it or putting the imprimatur of the courts on it. But I also think the court was almost scandalously willing to entertain some crazy ideas. And had this been closer, had it been only one or two states, uh, I think the court indicated some worrying things about general principles around vote by mail, general principles around whether state Supreme Courts uh, are allowed to adjudicate how states run their elections. So I think that I would say the courts did a great job. And also I will be very sad if some of the litigation around this election is used in future, weaponized in future to restrict voting. And so whether it's voting by mail, whether it's uh, blessing all kinds of vote suppression tactics under theories of vote fraud, I just think we have to be really mindful that the goalposts moved a little bit. They didn't move in any way that were determinative, but I think that we are now collectively as a society, but also even at the courts, entertaining some really noxious ideas about suppressing voting that is the absolute opposite of what I think the lesson of this election was. Uh, sobering, uh, important, um, as is your uh, statement that not only judges, but also election officials played a central role in maintaining nonpartisan legitimacy. Tim Wu had an interesting piece in the New York Times recently saying the reason election officials and judges uh, were nonpartisan is because they had an institutional interest in uh, maintaining allegiance to norms rather than to uh, partisan results. So um, it's very important friends who are listening to Dahlia's really important wisdom. You know that I'm always urging you, don't assume that judging is all politics because in this class, we're trying to separate our political from our constitutional views. We, um, I, I'm trying to urge you that in, at the courts at their best are uh, guided by constitutional methodology rather than by politics. And that that distinction is meaningful. 
But Dahlia and I are discussing these troubling changes that are really putting pressure on the courts and at least in some cases are uh, making it tough to engage in that separation. So just Dahlia, as, as you said, this is the great existential question of our age. Um, have there been institutional norms in the past uh, during the many years that you and I have been covering the courts that have led the Supreme Court to decide cases more slowly to constrain themselves? Uh, and what it, might those norms be eroding? And if so, what, in, in, addition, in addition to what we've already discussed, the speed of litigation, the number of cases of the court's decision, what are some of the factors that might be eroding those norms? Yeah, that, that is the, the question. And I think you and I have talked a lot over the years, Jeff, about, you know, I'm going to just say Federalist 78, about the fact that the court has neither the power of the purse nor the sword. What it has is our regard for the court and the public estimation that the court is by and large getting it right and trying to get it right. And that matters. And I think you and I have also talked before about how the person to whom that matters more than anyone is probably John Roberts. And that John Roberts conduct over the last two, three years, pretty much from the time that the court had eight people uh, and Merrick Garland was not seated, right up until yesterday, John Roberts conduct, the through line is he's trying to manage this deep anxiety as the court gets dragged further and further into partisan politics, and as the court is asked on both sides, right? I mean, Trump versus Hawaii, the, the travel ban case is one version of this. Uh, the census case is another version of it, but the court is being asked to decide essentially deep political questions, including questions about the legitimacy of Donald Trump himself. And the court is trying to thread that exact needle that you are describing, which is how do we maintain the appearance of legitimacy, of decorousness, of sober thoughtfulness, when we're also being used as a pinata by absolutely everyone up to and including this election, right? Where um, we saw a lot of a lot of language about, you know, Donald Trump has had three, three justices seated, but it's not enough. We need to get rid of John Roberts. I'll pop in the chat. Um, a critique of John Roberts that showed up yesterday from Josh Blackman um, at the Volokh conspiracy, essentially saying like, John Roberts isn't partisan enough. Like he needs to be more of a political actor and all this faux humility and trying to make it appear that the court is fair is awful. So I think the, the, the real issue for the justices is that the norm that the judiciary is a different kind of branch that is not a purely political branch, that in exchange for lifetime appointments, you behave and comport yourself as though you are looking at a lifetime of justice and not what just happened. And that's just being eroded. And that, you know, you can timestamp that at the Warren Court, you can timestamp it at court packing under FDR, you can say it starts in 2000 with Bush v. Gore, or you can say it starts when Donald Trump starts, you know, using the court as a football. Whatever place you want to use as your marker of when it begins, all the kinds of pressure you and I have described in the last 33 minutes are versions of pressure on that principle, the principle that the court acts as a different unelected branch that triangulates against something that isn't bare knuckle politics. And so I think that as that norm collapses, and I should be really clear, it's collapsed on the le left as much as the right. Um, and again, you can say that's because of Robert Bork or you can say it's be because of Merrick Garland, but I think that the court in some sense internalizes all that pressure in good ways and bad ways. And then I think that that becomes the orientation. The only thing the court can do, and certainly John Roberts can do right now, is try to fend off these claims that the court is just pulling the lever for the same person they voted for in the voting booth. And I think that that's really under profound, profound pressure right now. Fascinating. You just said an important thing that this norm of nonpartisanship is collapsed on the left as well as the right. You mentioned uh, some blame it on the Robert Bork hearings, others on the Merrick Garland, Garland hearings. We told our friends that we would talk about the confirmation process. Uh, you and I have been 
covering confirmations for a long time since Justice Ginsburg was nearly unanimously confirmed to today when it's not clear that a nominee can be confirmed unless uh, his or her party holds the Senate. Um, so to what degree have changes in the confirmation process contributed to this norm? And relatedly, our, our friend Colin asks in the chat whether the norm is erosion reflects just the general increased polarization in the, in the country as a whole. Um, again, I think th there's a cart horse question, which is if we can stipulate that the court has rightly or wrongly inserted itself into every big ticket issue in American life, right? From abortion to uh, 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 affirmative action, to guns, to LGBTQ rights and marriage across the boards, right? This is not the court of 150 years ago that did a lot more nothing or a lot of economic reg regulation, but just wasn't, I think, the arbiter of every single issue that is ripping the country apart. Now, you and I would probably say, hey, <laughs> some of that is to really good and important ends and outcomes, right? But for the court, we don't have Brown v. Board, but for the court, we don't have Griswold. So I think we can have a separate debate about whether the court has become too essential to how we live our lives in ways that are anti-democratic. But if we agree that that is happening, then it's not going to be a surprise that as the country is riven and polarized, the court becomes a part of that polarization. And I think that's essentially what we're seeing happen. That said, and you asked, I think there's no doubt that the confirmation process has contributed to that polarization. And you know, one of my critiques has long been, if you're going to televise something and not televise something else, don't televise the job interview in which the nominee says nothing, does nothing, and is generally just extremely annoying for three days, and then refuse to show us them on the job for decades doing really hard, diligent, good work, nonpartisan, careful, meticulous judicial work. So we're looking at the wrong thing, like it's a reality show. We're watching the, the um, job interview as though it's gonna tell us something. And by the way, the televising of that job interview makes us crazy and makes the nominee crazy. In some instances, the nominee never forgives us for what happens in the job interview. So I think we're focusing the TV cameras emphatically on the wrong piece of this and that if people, and I know all these questions, including Colin's question um, about civic education, I think if people could see what the Supreme Court does um, you know, from October to April, they would actually have a better sense of what the court is doing. And so I think that's part of the problem. We're in the dark about the worst stuff. Um, but beyond that, I think that it has become the case that if you, if the name of the game, Jeff, is to confirm somebody who's 40 years old, who has no record, who has never written or said anything interesting, important, so that they can be on the court for 50 years, and that is the name of the game, you are going to have a really toxic, toxic process. And people... I'm sure you all know this, but justices didn't even show up to their own confirmation hearings, I think until Brandeis, is that right? Who had to pop in his head when things were getting grim, but justices didn't show up. Senator Day O'Connor was the first televised confirmation hearing. Um, so I think that we have turned it into like crazy Kardashian land and with all the attendant politics and ugliness, and I see zero payoff from as a, as a court watcher, and I see huge consequences. You're so right to focus us on that, that metaphor, your notion of televising job interview, but not the job is so important. And it makes me want to ask um, about the telephone arguments. Those struck me as models of hearing the court in action. You heard the justices reasoning candidly. We heard Justice Thomas talking very extensively for the first time in many years. So that suggested to me, the problem is not lack of cameras because you could have the audio version to reveal the court's thinking. The problem, as you suggested earlier, may be the court just deciding cases without argument and rushing to uh, write, uh, pass down opinions like the COVID decision where there just wasn't a lot of reasoning offered at all. We got the result, but not the reasoning. And that obligation to give reasons is so core to what the court does. And when they move fast, they can't do that. So maybe just say a word 
about how the court operates, you know, how they sit around and vote and decide cases, how long it takes, and how much time you think they actually need uh, with, with full briefing and argument to be able to issue the thoughtful opinion <laughs> that we are looking for. I mean, I will say first and foremost, I, I get the sense that different justices feel very differently about the telephonic arguments. I think Justice Breyer's not digging them. I think that, and that's not based on anything he said to me or anything that he saw on MASH. I think he, it's not working for him, I think, because you cannot kind of build an arc the way, yeah, I would say, and this is just ridiculously inside baseball, you can, you can push back if you disagree, but I think the three justices who see their job as picking up an extra vote, and I, in that class I put Breyer, Kagan, and the chief as people who use oral argument in this really fascinating, hyper-vigilant way to be like, oh, wait, what? He's wobbling, let me jump in. Can't do that. Their superpower is almost completely nullified by the way the telephonic arguments are happening where they're just going boom, boom, boom by seniority down the line and they cut off each justice after the time runs out. And so there's no time to sort of build and develop an arc. And there's no way if Justice Kagan wants to bolster some concern that Justice Alito has expressed that she can jump in after him and say, hey, you know, which is really, I think her superpower. So I think it's, it's, it's in many ways, it's an interesting uh, insight. And I should note also, um, and I can pop it in the chat, but Leah Lippman did some early uh, looking at the numbers and it turned out, surprise, surprise, that the women <laughs> called on far less and got significantly less time. And that somehow, even in trying to be even handed and fair, the chief just gave significantly more time uh, to the male questioners, even with the time clock. So there's, there's problems with oral argument. Ironically, Jeff, and I, I haven't thought about this before, in some ways, this is a really interesting model of the public facing court, like the court is now performing in a way that I've been begging for 20 years, right? Just, I don't even need cameras, just let us hear the audio. And in so doing and becoming a public facing argument institution, it's losing some things that for the intimacy of these nine people who have to make decisions and, and work on each other to kind of get to five, they may be losing something there. And so then that's a really, I, I hadn't thought of it. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. good insight that in looking more transparent and open, they mm -hmm. may be losing some of the dynamics that amongst the nine of them make things tick. And I'm gonna have to think more about that. I mean, I think the simple answer is uh, it takes as much time as it takes. And then there are some cases where I think the justices do a straw poll right after uh, they hear an argument and they know, and it can be done and you can circulate drafts and you can be done in a week. I think in other cases, it can take months and sometimes years. Uh, and that is as long as it takes. So I, I don't think there's gonna ever be a one size fits all answer to how long does this have to take? I think we can agree and you're right in, in using the COVID case as an example of that, that when the court does kind of slapdash work and kind of coughs up a hairball opinion late at night saying, okay, you know, we're gonna just invalidate the Colorado COVID restrictions because blah, 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 religious liberty. Uh, it starts to create an anxiety in the public that maybe there are classes of cases that they're very worried about. We'll call them religious liberty and classes of cases that they're not super worried about. Brandon Garrett at UVA had a really good piece in Slate yesterday saying, it's amazing how anxious the courts are about hypothetical religious liberty in, in uh, churches in COVID and absolutely have no problem with prison regulations that are literally killing people uh, in COVID and seems to be no urgency for the court to step in there. So maybe this is a long winded way of saying Part of the problem with the shadow docket and the really exigent briefing and or non-briefing and exigent opinions that are not clear is that they start to actually create a pointillist view of what the justices are worried about. And I completely appreciate that religious liberty is one of the things that a majority of this court is worried about in COVID, but it does signal a sort of slapdash willingness to fight for certain outcomes and not others. And I do think that in the aggregate that starts to be anxiety producing for the public.
Wow, it's so great to hear you think on your feet about this really important question. Sarah Cunningham sums your really important insight up as losing something grave, deep deliberation. That, that, that is what is lost. And as you just said, the dynamic at a live oral argument can be part of that deliberation. It can also take place at the conference and it can take place in the exchange of drafts where not often, but sometimes votes can shift, but at the very least uh, arguments can be refined and the dissent can strengthen the majority as Justice Ginsburg liked to say that Justice Scalia strengthened her uh, majorities and dissents and something can be lost. You and, I, you and I know as journalists, when we do our really fastest work, it's sometimes not our best. When you've got a, when you've got a really tight deadline, you're not gonna be able to dig in as deeply. And there's a kind of slapdash feeling about some of these recent uh, decisions with factual errors of the kind that would be avoided with more time that really seem to be antithetical to that notion of deep deliberation. Um, Curry, as usual, when Dolly and I get together, I'm so, I'm just monopolizing all her time because I love getting her insights so much, but I know that we need to wrap up in a moment. Curry, do you have some questions from our friends? One or two last questions you want to pose to Dolly? Really quickly, one is a statement from Bev, who suggested that you come back quarterly and do a huh. Supreme Court in review quarterly. And I'm just going to second that because I love that idea. And then two, we have a lot of teachers on today where their students are out of school and they chose to come today to hear you. And one of the questions from them was, what do you think some of the big cases are going to be coming up? So I think those questions work together because you could give us a little sneak peek and then come back and give us an update. So just putting those both out at you. And, and I should just note that um, except for this uh, spring when we couldn't come, I do the ADL's um, big term wrap up uh, in the august walls of the Constitution Center. And with any luck, uh, we'll all be vaccinated and traveling and doing it again this year. But, um, but I'm happy to come back. Um, you know, this is just, we're in a funny interregnum where the court, I'm sure you've heard um, folks say before, Justice White used to always say, every time you get a new justice on the court, you get a whole new court. So this is not, you know, minus RBG plus uh, Coney Barrett. This is an entirely different institution. And sometimes Justice Alito has said that can take two, three years until you figured out what this whole new court is. So while Jeff and I are talking about things going too fast, going too fast, it's also clear the justices are figuring each other out. And that's doubly hard when they're not in person uh, at the court. So I think this will probably be a relatively quiet term. Uh, I think that, you know, we certainly have that census case which just got kicked away. I think that there, uh, I'm sure you've talked about the Philadelphia case about uh, foster care. Uh, that's one to watch for. I put it under the bucket of religious liberty cases that I think are gonna be incredibly interesting uh, kind of predictor of where this court is going on religious liberty. And then I would just really watch, I think there are a couple of uh, reproductive rights cases that the court uh, has been kicking away, but wants to look at. There's for sure some gun cases expanding uh, the scope of the second amendment. And I think really the thing to watch if you're a teacher uh, and trying to help students understand the court and the constitution is what's gonna happen when the dynamic is exactly reversed, which is Donald Trump tried to do a lot of things by executive order, by the stroke of a pen, when he couldn't get right things through Congress, he tried to do it uh, unilaterally. We're about to see Joe Biden has already promised a kind of FDR style, I'm gonna do all the things I'm gonna, you know, resolve environmental questions and pollution questions. I'm going to resolve uh, a whole bunch of things that he feels went wrong. And a lot of that is going to be done by executive power. So I think really in a weird way, the battle is going to be watching the court uh, in some ways trying to restrict or limit what a Biden administration tries to put into effect really quickly. And so those are the things that I am looking at. Jeff will say what I've missed. Um, but I also really, really think that uh, conversations that we don't always have in the public sphere about court expansion, about term limits, about ways to cabin the authority of the court for some of the reasons Jeff and I 
flicked at today, I think some of those are going to really surface in the coming months of feeling like with almost you know 250 Trump appointees on the federal courts, uh, what what is going to be a way to break that logjam? And I think we may actually have interesting conversations about things like 18 year term limits for justices. Awesome, Jeff, wanna bring us home? Well, 18 year term limits for justices was one of the reforms endorsed by at least two out of our three teams, conservative, progressive, and libertarian for our great constitution drafting project. And Dahlia, I wanna share that with you offline because it was really surprising and interesting that these very different teams of scholars all agreed that uh, term limits might be uh, salutary. Whether they could be passed in practice is another question. And it's one of the many that we will be exploring here in class, on our podcasts, and on all the National Constitution Center platforms. Dahlia, it is just a joy always to speak with you, to learn with you, and to share your wisdom with our friends. Uh, friends, uh, your Jeff work, that's what we call the fun voluntary homework that people choose to do. And you can do it over the holidays because what better time to learn uh, and grow is to read all of Dahlia's wonderful work um, at Slade and elsewhere, to listen to her phenomenal podcast. She just has a unique ability to bring the court to life, life and with penetrating insight and deep wisdom help us understand the way this crucial institution works. So I will end by uh, first of all wishing you, Dahlia, the happiest of holidays. Uh, stay safe. And now um, I'll also send the same wish uh, from Curry and me and all of our Constitution Center colleagues to the great teachers, to the great students. And in addition to Jeff work, if you don't feel like that, just take a well-deserved break. You've been doing so much remote learning. You've been so engaged with us. We're so grateful for your passion for the Constitution. Hope you have a wonderful holiday and see you in the new year. Thank you all very much. We'll see you next year. <laughs> Sounds great.